Welcome, everybody. We're we're happy to have you today for Sleep and Diabetes, Considerations for the Thanksgiving Table. It's funny. I was just looking at one of the places that we um, promoted this webinar on Facebook, and <laughs> there's a really great group that some of you, I know Esperanza, I see that you're here. There's a... Uh, um, <laughs> There's a funny guy in the uh, Fun with Sleep Apnea group, and he's, I, I said, for, you know, the slide here, and he, he says, oh, he said, consideration, number one, don't fall asleep in your mashed potatoes and keep your elbows off the table. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Well, I'm just glad that, to have everybody here today. We, uh, everybody is probably cooking and getting ready for the big the big feast, and I thought this was a nice time to uh, uh, show what we can do with the the Thanksgiving table. Um, next slide, please. Sean, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, but a little bit of housekeeping before we go any further. If you're attending this webinar live, you may type into the chat box if you have a question, and we'll go over them at the end of the webinar. Uh, we may have an open mic session near the end if we have time, so um, you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but uh, you know we, we welcome that and are always happy to hear people interacting. And today we're going to have some door prizes. Uh, so to be, let me tell you about the door prizes first. We're going to have two drawings for two different draw uh, door prizes. Two different drawings, I mean. Um, so two people that are in attendance on the live the live webinar. Uh, are going to receive a Philips Respironics Amara Gel Full Face Mask Fit Pack. And that includes the CPAP mask and the headgear. Thank you to our friends at Respironics uh, for these wonderful gifts. Um, we must ask that you have a prescription verification required. It's required for winners. So if you... Um, will look at uh, the instructions that you'll get if you are the winner. But for now, I need everybody that wants to have their name in the hat to send a name and a shipping address to ASAA at sleepapnea.org. If you can quickly do that, uh, that way we can... Uh, we can determine, and we will announce the winners after the webinar, and you will be contacted. If you're watching the recorded version of this webinar, you may also email any questions you have about the presentation to ASAA at sleepapnea.org. Next slide, please. Food definitely plays a role in how you sleep. We always are looking for foods to avoid for uh, for deep, unbroken sleep. Uh, one second here. Having a little bit of problem. Okay. Um, anyway, research has proven that you know, this definitely impacts our sleep. Uh, it's not just our imagination, and diabetics know this all too well. Um, there are certain things that we should avoid for a deep, unbroken sleep. Um, and we have some really great research that came out of Columbia University in New York um, that found that participants in the study who ate more fat and sugar and less fiber than others didn't have a great sleeping pattern and woke up a lot during the night. So um, I don't know if any of you experience a lot of waking during the night, but
but uh, it is very common. Also, it was found that those who ate meals that were higher in protein and lower in fat fell asleep quicker. Interesting. Dr. Uh, Marie-Pierre Saint-Ange says that our main finding was diet quality influenced by sleep quality. It was the most surprising a single day of greater fat intake and lower fiber could induce could influence sleep parameters. Next slide, please. If you're tired after eating, um, you can uh, look to our friends at the University of Manchester in England. Research conducted there found that high blood glucose levels can reduce brain cell activities that would normally keep a person awake. Certain neurons in the brain are turned off when those levels rise. And those neurons are also less active at night when the body rests and conserves its energy. The same is true after a meal, especially if the meal was high in sugar. Neurons in the brain signal your body to rest and save energy when satiated. One second, please. I need to check something. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the sleep and diabetes connection here is that, you know, all, I mean, all human beings need sleep. We all we all do. That's the one common thing about I always felt being in the sleep uh, medicine world is that everybody would talk to you about their sleep if they knew you were in the business because, it, you know, it's it's and, and it, it's what people talk about at the water cooler at work every day. Oh, I slept terribly, you know, that kind of thing. It's 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 something that every one of us has in common. And we all have different sleep routines and patterns. The commonality is that quality sleep makes a huge impact to everyone's overall health. For those with diabetes, sleep is incredibly important to keeping symptoms in control and improving an overall sense of well-being. In fact, sleep is so important that it's considered one of our four pillars of health. Next slide, please. Big word, postprandial somnolence. Uh, postprandial, I will explain, but somnolence means sleep. Does the food coma exist? A food coma is the common term used to describe the sensation of feeling sleepy or tired after you eat. A food coma really doesn't technically exist in the sense that you cannot normally experience a uh, food-induced coma. The term refers to a real phenomenon, and the medical name for feeling tired is quite a mouthful. So I think, you know, it was the food coma term, uh, to coin a phrase, <laughs> was easier to pronounce and more instinctual to understand. Although it's possible that there is a psychological effect at play in feeling a food coma, there are very real physical explanations behind how one happens and why. And I think most diabetics know what I'm talking about, um, that after, uh, you know, you just could just nod off. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even... It doesn't even take uh, high carbs to do it. The mo Next slide, please. Don't save your stomach for the big meal. I remember as a kid hearing my mom say that, oh, I'm saving myself for the turkey. I'm saving myself, you know. And so she wouldn't eat, and she was just, you know, I, I I thought, well, you know, that that's probably a good idea, and I tried the same thing then as I got older, and it was a mistake because um, you shouldn't fast. If you you end up overeating 
because you, and eating quickly because you are so hungry by the time the meal is presented. So eat a protein-rich breakfast. That will carry you through, and research has proven that a protein-packed breakfast can reduce hunger-stimulating hormones more successfully than a high-carb breakfast. So skip the pancakes and go for it. Down at the bottom there, you'll see um, a suggestion, have some milk, two scrambled eggs. Eggs are wonderful for uh, giving you that protein punch. Maybe a quarter of an avocado, which is just packed full of good fats, and a half cup of fiber-rich strawberries. Yum. Protein in the morning provides the energy needed to stay fueled and sets the pace for balanced eating throughout the day. Even when you're going to have parties and such, uh, in the evening. Next slide, please. And quit blaming the turkey's trip to pan for da- drowsiness. As you hear that so many times, but it's a myth. It's an urban legend handed down from our parents and their parents and their parents. Yes, turkey contains the serotonin influencing tryptophan, but beef, fish, chicken, they all have as much as as the turkey does. So none of these meats by themselves contain enough to make drowsiness happen. The real culprit is that oversized, high-carb holiday meal, the stuffing, the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, all the sugars, the the uh, pies. So, a side note here, in the brain, serotonin acts as a neurotransmitter that is involved in the control of pain perception, the sleep-wake cycle, and mood balance. So, do, is it any wonder that you hear people fighting at Thanksgiving? You know, you, you hear families just getting after it with, you know, I mean, they probably don't, some of them don't like each other to start with, but that mood imbalance, you know, from Uncle Harry, it's uh, it's quite, quite the experience if you've experienced that. Uh, next slide, please. So what foods are causing fatigue for the most part? The drowsy foods, the sweet and starchy carbs, White rice, cookies, cake, Uh, you know, you know the drill. And as you know, these foods can cause your blood sugar levels to go haywire. So eating a donut, for example, gives us a temporary sugar high, trailed by listlessness and tired and hungry feelings. We might be tempted to eat yet another donut to get that sugar high back. Doesn't that look good, though? This only leads to energy highs and lows, a vicious cycle. I just want that donut right now. (laughs) Next slide. Thank you, Sean. Sean is doing a great job. He always does. Um. The science behind the foods that cause uh, fatigue. The body's reaction to carbohydrates can be explained by the, by the glycemic index. Glycemic index is a system of assigning a number to carbohydrate-containing foods according to how much food each food increases blood sugar. The higher the index a food has, the more fluctuation occurs in your blood sugar levels when you ingest the food. When your sugar levels are high, the hormone insulin is released from your pancreas to combat the sudden rise in blood sugar and bring it back to an acceptable level. Wider fluctuations in your blood sugar levels increase the amount of fatigue you can experience. I know when I was um, first diagnosed, I'm a, I'm a diabetic, And when I was first diagnosed, I couldn't understand why I was sleeping all the time. Just all the time I just wanted to sleep and sleep. Well, it was because I was eating all those gummy bears. Uh, (laughs) And you can, I love gummy bears and M&M's. Those are my two naughty 
uh, naughty foods. But you know, this is this is the problem, and uh, you have to really watch it. And your pancreas. I know that my my educator, my diabetes educator, explained to me. I said, "Well, why am I sleeping all the time? What's what does this have to do with it?" She says, "Well." She says, just think about it. Your your pancreas is doing all this work and you just it has to you have to rest. Like all the energy in your body is going towards, you know, digestion right now. And so you have to sleep. And I was like, Well, you know, there's a little more science to that, but it was a good way of getting it into my brain in the onset because I was in total denial about having diabetes, believe me. Um, next slide, please. This is just a pretty good um, photo here of the digestive system. And actually, you know, it starts with our our teeth and our salivary glands. Uh, it's very much a part of the digestion, and it triggers everything else down the road to uh, follow suit. Next slide, please. Turning starches into sugars. Try this sometime for a an experiment. Taste a, a little tiny piece of unsalted plain cracker. Put it on your tongue. Close your mouth and let it sit on your tongue for a few minutes and sort of dissolve. And you have that you'll have a taste of a sudden slight sweetness. That's the salivary enzymes breaking a long complex starch molecule into its component parts, which are sugars. Once you swallow, the rest of the digestion of the starch takes place further down in the intestine, just what we were talking about from the photo. Next slide, please. Insulin, your blood sugar levels inevitably spike following a meal. For controlling and breaking down the sugars, your pancreas releases insulin. One of the effects of insulin is subduing blood sugar. You feel tired, less energetic, yes, yes, yes. Since larger increases in blood sugar warrant more insulin activity, large meals create a more prominent sleepiness effect. Yes. Next slide, please. For diabetics, let's, let's and for anyone really, I mean, this is a good idea. Uh, eat a little bit of everything at that Thanksgiving table. You want to you want to taste everything you've been waiting so long, and oh my goodness, someone has worked very hard to uh, prepare this meal. Keep keep in mind that you're human, and it's okay to have some of these naughties occasionally. Um, but just keep the portions in mind. Have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Load up on veggies. You know the picture. Have you seen you've seen the plate picture where you have half of it is greenery or salad and then you have a little part of it is the meat and a little part is the starch. Well, that's really what you would like it to look like, but in the in the matter of Thanksgiving it's gonna be a lot of little dollops of food. Choose what looks good and take bite sized portions just to taste it. And remember that you can always go back for more if you're still hungry. Next slide, please. Here's some, uh, and I would love to hear some of your suggestions on things that you've done. So please feel free to write to that email address and let me know things that you've tried because we would love to um, share that with everybody on a later date. But this is, you know, if you love pumpkin pie, you know, the crust is not so good for us. So try a pumpkin custard. You still get that pumpkin taste. And this is a very good, and I haven't figured out the carb index, but it's way lower, way lower for sure. Um, so I got this from um, from the American Diabetes Association. Next slide, please. This is a really great idea here. I love it. I'm always trying to turn nuts and natural gluten-free things into bread or something like 
has everyone seen the trick with the with the cauliflower and it's shredded up and it has cheese in it and instead of a pizza crust i love that stuff i mean it's it's something it's something that kind of uh you know holds the food on there holds your pizza toppings but yet it's it's uh, very good for you but this is great uh, they made this pie crust out of dates, nuts, oats, and pumpkin pie spice. And it looks like they put it into their blender, their food processor. And, you know, once you once you have started to uh, pulse or process that food processor, all the oils are going to come out of the foods and mesh together. You can always drop a little bit of water in there as well if they're not sticking. Next slide, we have questions. So how about, let's look and see how many people we have. We have a good crowd today. Um, has everybody sent in their um, entry for the free mask to ASAA at sleepapnea.org? That would be great. Um, we have Becky. I'm just looking at everybody that's here. We have Becky and Bob and Esperanza, my friend from Fun Sleep Apnea. John Phillip. We have Justine. We have someone from Albuquerque. Uh, we have someone from California. Someone from Venice, Florida. Awesome. Okay. If you would like to speak, feel free, and we're going to open that up right now. Um, if you have if you have a lot of noise in the background, you can just mute, mute your phone. But I don't hear I don't hear anything. So let's see. Is Becky here? Can Becky? Can we say hi to Becky and Bob? Hello. Hello, how are you today? I'm doing okay. <laughs> Would you like to tell us some tricks that you you have, or anybody really, that would like to tell us about some tricks that you have to uh, keep your carbs down and keep yourself from falling asleep? I'm, I'm still working on that. I haven't conquered that one yet. <laughs> oh, are you newly My diagnosed? I've had sugar for about two years, but here lately it just, I've got down to a lot of health problems. Yeah. And it just seems like it's working against my sugar. Yeah. So it's, hard. it's very hard. We're working on, I've got to see a heart doctor and I've got to see this doctor and I've got to see, you know, a pulmonologist yeah. and. Well, you yeah. know, when I was first diagnosed, I was so scared that I immediately went into great patient mode and I, I the only sweet thing I would I took to curb that sweet craving I would I would have a grapefruit every night every night a grapefruit and that seemed to curb it and I I was just my numbers went wonderfully well at my next visit but then I kind of relaxed and thought well you know I can have I think I'm still in denial <laughs> yeah <laughs> But once it, now I'm now I'm back on the I'm scared because I started I started reading all about cardiac issues and I was like okay all right I'm gonna be good now so <laughs> it, luckily for me it's grapefruit season again so uh, well, I can't have grapefruit so <laughs> oh you can't because of your car well because of the meds some, yeah try some try something fruity and and yummy just yeah. hang in there. Hang in there, Becky. <laughs> Bob, are you here? Or anybody want to say something? Just come on. No? Um, I'll say no. something. Is this, this Esperanza? Is yeah, this is Esperanza. Hi. Hi there. Um, I guess what's hard for me is this year, we always, well, we always do Thanksgiving lunch, not Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. And this year we're waiting for a family member to get off work at 2.30. So mm -hmm. I'm going to eat really late. Or mm -hmm. if you think of it as dinner really early. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure how to space my meals. 
and then we have chips and salsa out, and so then I snack on that because I'm hungry. <laughs> so that's the part that I don't know how to space my meals tomorrow with the late lunch. You know what I read that um, drinking a lot of water, a lot of water, and also to, you know, find the things, you know, the little snackies on the table that are going to keep you satisfied, like celery, you know, that kind of thing. I know it's not the same as grabbing that chunk of turkey, <laughs> you know, but, or, you know, some stuffing, but that's, they just, you know, suggest the noshing. The American Diabetes Association, anyway, they said just nosh on the healthy stuff. I'll try that. <laughs> Thanks. Does anybody hi, this else? Is, hi, this is Justine. Hi, Justine. We often, uh, we, because we eat Thanksgiving, um, an early supper, you know, around 4 o'clock or sometimes even 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So we'll just have a light uh, breakfast, maybe cereal, maybe eggs, maybe not as protein rich as we should or something. And then um, then I usually just set out all of those snacks that you're talking about. We do a lot of, um, we have chips and salsa too, um, but we also, I put out some guacamole because that mm-hmm. helps, you know, with having, mm-hmm. like you were saying, with the avocado and uh, hummus and like, you know, maybe like cherry tomatoes or carrots or something like that um, because that's, you know, made from a bean, so that helps helps keep you full. And um, when you had your suggestion of celery, it made me laugh because um, I thought back, way back to when my grandmother used to put out um, celery with peanut butter, <laughs> you know, so... Um, mm-hmm. I always liked that as a kid, and I haven't had it in a long time. But then when you mentioned that, I was like, oh, I should probably put that out. We have a couple of kids. And, you know, it helps helps the celery, you know, get a little more filling, a little more flavor. Uh, and, the, and the peanut butter can, you know, kind of give you that little protein and help help carry carry you through. It definitely does. I was, when I was first diagnosed, I used to keep a jar of it on my desk. The not the sugar kind, but the the natural kind that you have to stir and stir. But um, my husband has to stir it for me because I can't get it mixed right. But anyway, I would keep that at the desk, and when I would have you know need to eat something, instead of running in there and grabbing a sandwich or whatever, I would just have a spoon of that, and that would just be fine. I was that would hold me over. I was more satisfied when I was doing that. I need to do it some more and put the gummy bears away. (laughs) Oh, well, it's been really nice talking to everybody. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? I know Bob said he doesn't have, um, he doesn't have a microphone. Um, If you call in next time, if you use your phone to call in instead of using the, um, the online version, you you know, we can unmute you and you can talk. But I am just really happy to have everybody here. And um, let's see, do we have another slide there at the end? Oh yeah, let's put that. Let's put that uh, next slide up where uh, it it gives the address. Yeah, there you go. You can always contact us. Uh, through and wherever you found us, um, wherever you found us, you know the the promotion or whatever that that brought you to us, uh, this this uh, email address is on there as well, and our website is uh, www.sleepapnea.org. Well, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful holiday. And we will see you next time. Our next um, our next webinar is going to be uh, on COPD and sleep. So keep that in mind and be looking for it. It's always on the second. Thank you, Becky. Um, our, it's going to be on the second and 
the fourth Wednesday of every month. We might have, thank you, Esperanza, you too, um, when we, um, when we announce the next one. I'm not sure what time, uh, what time we're going to have that. We, we seem to have a better audience here at the daytime, so we might do that and have them in the daytime. Please let me know, though, in your email if you prefer a daytime or a nighttime uh, webinar. We would love to uh, make it uh, make it very uh, convenient for everyone. All right. Regarding the masks, um, what did you want to say, Sean? I... Oh, yeah, we're going to... Uh, we will reach out to you directly. I think I told you that before. We can't check the email at this point because it's just it's just a lot going on. But we, and John says daytime is best for him. Great, great. I'm glad for the feedback. All right, everybody. Happy holidays. Take care.